Hello, everyone. You're about to hear a recap of the movie The Pod Generation. Enjoy the movie. Begins with Rachel dreaming about being pregnant and admiring her large belly in the mirror. When she wakes up, she uses an AI powered voice assistant to prepare breakfast and coffee for her husband, Elvie, before heading to work. Elvie, a botanist, spends his time in the workshop tending to plants while Rachel is away. During a company meeting, Rachel highlights the company's success and the impending advancement of voice assistants, which are set to become even more intelligent and pervasive in everyday life. Artificial intelligence is steadily overcoming human limitations. After the meeting, her boss calls her in to discuss a potential promotion and questions Rachel about her family plans, wondering if she intends to have children or focus on her career. Back in her office, Rachel receives a message from the Womb Center, a facility specializing in family planning and artificial wombs. They have an opening and schedule a meeting with her to go over the details. Processing the unexpected news, Rachel talks to her friend and colleague, Alice. They discuss how Rachel hasn't informed her husband, who is a staunch advocate of natural pregnancy and traditional values. Feeling anxious, Rachel visits her therapist, an AI-controlled eye. She worries about her husband's reaction to the planned pregnancy, but the therapist reassures her that there is nothing to fear. Progress is inevitable. At home, Rachel listens to Elvie talk about his day. He convinced one of his students to try a real fruit picked directly from a tree, a rare experience in their sterile, artificial world. Rachel still can't bring herself to tell him what happened. On the scheduled day, she goes to the womb center. For newcomers, the CEO of the corporation, who looks suspiciously like Amazon's Jeff Bezos, speaks from a big screen. Then, an employee named Linda gives the clients a tour, explaining how everything works. The fetus is nurtured in a specially designed artificial womb called a capsule. This allows women to shed the yoke of patriarchy and dedicate their lives to their own interests. At the end of the tour, Rachel is asked to make a deposit to ensure the expensive equipment is not wasted in case she backs out. In the evening, Alvi asks a question about the debit, and Rachel has no choice but to tell him about her visit to the center. However, he isn't ready to become a father through such an unconventional modern method. To convince him, Rachel takes him to visit Alice, who is also expecting a baby. Her husband is handling the capsule, allowing Alice to focus on her career. But even this doesn't ease Elvie's doubts. He's not thrilled about becoming a caregiver. Rachel then insists he sees her therapist, but Elvie, who prefers natural processes, is uncomfortable interacting with an emotionless machine. Apparently, he watched Terminator as a kid and learned his lesson well. Eventually, understanding how important this is to Rachel, Elvie agrees to the artificial pregnancy in the capsule. When they sign the contract at the center, they learn that the man's involvement is not mandatory. They could have used just the woman's biological material, although that would guarantee a female child. After signing, Linda shows them a visualization of the fertilization process, commenting on the competition between sperm cells as enthusiastically as a sports commentator. These enzymes which digest sperm receptor proteins, preventing polyspermy. Oh, here we go. Then, the soon-to-be parents are shown a vial containing the zygote, and the process begins. When Rachel's parents learn about the planned addition to the family, they offer to sell their country house on a remote island. However, Elvie is strongly against it. He loves the untouched nature there, although Rachel, a true city child, hates visiting. Days pass by. The egg develops in the capsule, and Rachel learns to use the special app to manage it. Elvie remains skeptical, refusing to acknowledge the embryo until it develops a heartbeat. At the womb center, where Rachel visits the capsule, a nurse confirms that the fetus hasn't developed enough, echoing Elvie's thoughts. Rachel cares for the capsule, experiencing vague flashbacks of how she became a mother the last time. From similar eggs, fire-breathing reptiles had hatched. She continues to have nightmares about natural pregnancy, 
which she discusses with her electronic therapist. Soon, the couple visits the center together and looks at the developing embryo through a special window in the capsule. Rachel starts preparing the nursery. Following the voice assistant's advice, Elvie brings an olive tree pot to the windowsill. Rachel dislikes the real plant, so a disappointed Elvie returns him to the greenhouse, trying to get used to the idea of her having a baby. Rachel brings the capsule home from the center. They place it in their bedroom, but Elvie is uncomfortable with having the baby so close, so they move the device to the nursery. As they go to sleep, an alarm sounds. The embryo needs to be fed with special plates, and Rachel assigns this task to her husband. The next day, they visit the center with other expecting parents to learn about the nursery facilities. They discover that in the future, children won't even engage in creative activities. AI creates for them, while they merely comment on the results. Days pass. Elvie, now tasked with monitoring the capsule, spends more and more time with it, gradually developing feelings for the future child. He carries it in a special harness, reads its stories, takes it on walks, swings it, and even brings it to work. During an evening documentary about penguins, Rachel notices her husband's newfound sentimentality. She starts feeling jealous of the baby while visiting Alice, discussing her husband's strange behavior and her dreams with her friends doesn't bring her peace. They consult their therapist to find a compromise and stop acting like normal people. The robot therapist suggests they connect directly to the embryo to address psychological issues and parental influence before birth, fostering a closer bond with the future child. Rachel takes the capsule to work, but its presence negatively impacts her colleagues. Following her boss's orders, Alice asks Rachel to place the capsule in a special storage unit designed for such situations. Working late, Rachel misses a family seminar for expectant parents at the womb center. At the end of the seminar, Linda asks the couples to leave their capsules for safekeeping. Suddenly, both Elvie and Rachel feel an emptiness at home without it. Rachel dreams of the child again, and her emotional instability makes her reconsider her views. In the middle of the night, she moves the olive tree into the nursery. During their next visit to the center, Linda informs them of a policy change. Now, instead of waiting for the baby to emerge naturally from the capsule, a specific birth date is scheduled. This approach frees up the capsules at the right time, making them available for the next parents without unnecessary delays. The couple isn't too pleased with this practical and orderly approach, but all the terms are clearly stated in the contract. Additionally, Linda hands them special pills that will be needed once the baby is born. These pills will help the baby sleep soundly and dream, with the dreams being updated over time. As they leave the center, they encounter a protest by radical feminists against the use of capsules for reproduction. Elvie has a sudden idea and sneaks back into the center to take their capsule home. That night, Rachel dreams of a giant supermarket selling babies, with some even on sale. At the checkout, a cashier tries to sell her additional pills from the womb center, but it's too much for the exhausted mother-to-be. It was easier with dragons, she thinks sadly as she wakes up, realizing she's caught not only in the trap of technological progress, but also in the web of capitalism. Determined not to return the capsule to the center, she wants the birth to be as natural as possible under such unnatural circumstances. She starts packing a suitcase, planning to escape to their country house on the island. Elvie, once again, has to comply with his wife's wishes. He goes to talk to Linda about the possibility of a home birth, but she is adamantly against it. The capsules are expensive and must be returned so it's best to stick to the contract. Moreover, a special code is required to open the artificial egg. Finding no empathy from the company representative, the couple secretly heads to the countryside. There, they wander through the picturesque scenery, enjoying the fresh sea air, the singing birds, and the lush greenery. 
LV gives Rachel a lecture about lichens, and she slowly gets accustomed to the sunrises and sunsets far from the skyscrapers and city lights. After a few days, the capsule's charging station stops working. LV discovers through the app that the womb center has remotely deactivated it. Panicked, Rachel suggests they rush back before the baby dies without sustenance. However, the battery has enough power to last 48 hours. LV convinces her to wait. The baby is almost ready to be born. Early one morning, the capsule's light signals that the baby is ready to come into the world. But without the special code, they can't open the capsule. Rachel tries guessing the code using significant dates, but fails. Elvie decides to take drastic measures and perform a mechanical cesarean section on the capsule. Armed with a hammer from his workshop, he carefully pries the lid open. Once the lid gives way, they see their baby inside. Using his strength, Elvie splits the capsule into two halves and lifts the baby out, handing it to the overjoyed mother. The next morning, Rachel wakes up early. While her husband and baby are still asleep, she carefully packs the remnants of the capsule into a cardboard box. She rides her bike to the post office and ships the expensive equipment back to its owners. Returning home, she snuggles back into bed with her husband and baby, smiling contentedly. The film could end here, but in a post credit scene, the corporation's CEO gives an interview. The pseudo-Bezos character explains that soon, technological advancements will reach such heights that children grown in their facilities will be able to choose their own parents, away with outdated traditions, and welcome to the bright future of continuous consumption. And with that, the film concludes.